Hello friends, host Eric here, host of Talking with Fans People, and I'm sitting outside to answer a question that Zachary, host Zachary, was kind enough to ask me, and it prompted me to realize that I really hadn't ever quite put the whole thing together on video. I, I never really quite realized I had it all put together yet, but I do actually have it all put together in my head, and so I will finish explaining the the final put together I guess or n nothing's ever final but you know what I mean uh, so it goes like this so we regarding the, the idea of morality being objective or ethics being objective and that they that it being absolute and that there being a right and wrong ethics a correct and incorrect one and that there's no other possible way to conceive of an ethical action except through this one single correct moral imperative it's Kant's moral imperative basically you sh you sh you shan't treat another agent as a means to an end but rather the and an end in itself as an end in itself <laughs> and that produces the non-aggression principle and the negative rights framework it correlates with it perfectly. So, the negative rights framework is a deontological framework. So, when we're talking about this, and people want to say, smart people, especially, always want to default to relativism because they understand the power of NE to dismantle non relativist conclusions. And they've, they've had those arguments fail. They've had all their, the absolutist arguments fail, and so they don't want to, they have learned that smart people are hesitant to commit to abstractions of any sort. They've seen other abstractions cause horrific atrocities, or at least correlate with them strongly. So we know that ideologies fail, so why, Eric, would this one ideology be the one single true ideology? Well, let's start at the time object space object distinction just to remind everybody in case there's somebody who's watching this for the, the, no background in any of my previous videos or something I'm gonna do a little bit of recapping so time objects are objects that require duration uh, that require energy to persist they have duration the reason they necessarily have duration is because they are objects that represent agent experience rather than that with that which agents experience so the distinction there is a, something like this this object in space is not it, it's part of my experience insofar as I'm feeling it right now holding it looking at it and that part of the experience can be made into part of a time object. The experience part, the looking at it, the holding it. I, the, the holding it can't really be made into a time object for you. We can experience something very equivalent in the looking at it. Obviously, it looks a lot different to me in person than it does when I look at it on the screen. But right now, we're looking at basically the same thing because I'm looking at it on the screen. So... That experience, the experience of me holding this object, blah, 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 blah. This experience is a subjective, subjective experience until I turn it into a time object. It's no longer a subjective experience because I have made a video out of it and put it up on YouTube. So this time object, this video, contains within it a representation of the experience of holding this object and a representation of the experience of... Um, I don't like that brown square. Ah, that solves it. Okay. No more brown square. So, part of this time object then is this little messing with technology to get rid of that brown square. For part of this time object, I have a brown square around my face. That's objectively true. I, And yet, at no point in my life have I actually had a brown square around my face, right? But, it's... For the purpose of this time object, I certainly did for part of this video. 
Now, the time object is distinct. We know it's distinct in this case, in part because it has duration. And so, and that duration doesn't change. Next time you watch this video, if you watch it again, it's not going to be shorter or longer. It's going to be the same length. And yet, you can't hold it in one piece in the same way that you can hold this thing in one piece because this time object has duration, whereas this thing does not. So that's one of the key distinctions between a time object and a space object is the duration issue. But there are plenty of other ways to think about it that are significant differences. For example, if I didn't put the energy into making this a time object, it would disappear. I don't have to do anything. This stays where this continue to appears to continue to exist for me uh, without, with or without me. It appears to be more objective that it's its existence, its re, its manifest reality is independent of me in a way that this time object would seem to not be independent of me. Except when we break down a little bit, we realize once I render something into an object, it is independent of me. So this time object, I, I might have control over this time object, just like I have control over this. I could, in theory, it would be hard to break. This thing's really like a heavy metal thing. It's, I like it because it's, it's got some weight to it, you know. It's, it's made out of solid metal. But uh, I, I may be in control of the time object because I could delete the video, I guess, or put it unlisted. But the thing is, if I I have to take action at that point, it has it has an existence beyond me, and without my action, I it will persist, but not because. Not, not on its own like this, but rather because now that it's been established as a time object and other people have viewed it, they make it more real. Observation makes time objects more real and it gives them greater size, basically. Significance. So, a space object has literal size, a mountain's bigger than this thing, and what is this thing you're probably wondering? It's, it's something you screw on the top of something? It's like a little, a little knob thing. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> I like it though. The uh, I like cool things like this. Anyway, what are they saying? Right. So let's get. So the time objects persist once they are rendered into objects. They necessarily are going to persist in some little bit. How? real they are, how much they persist, it depends on the nature of the time object and the amount of observation they undergo. So, if I say one sentence to you in passing, that's a time object. Because I've rendered part of my experience into words such that my experience can be taken away from me as a subjective subject, individual, self-contained reality and it goes through this this intermediate space between between individuals which there there is no intermediate space but it exists in concept it exists as a time object outside of outside of its active launching and yet we can't really know it without experiencing it because it has duration so given all that let's talk a little bit about the moral imperative issue we we understand objects as being things that are distinct from other things and there's no reason to suppose that our the objects we make out of our experience and those are going to be things like this video yes but it's also going to be things like t any kind of text uh, still image also has its own kind of duration which is to say it appears to be identical to a space object in that it's something you look at it's an it, it 
engages you visually with a single image. However, it's not like that because if it's an image presented for if it's if it's intentionally presented image in other words somebody took the time to make it somebody it didn't it's not occurring it's not part of the reality you're currently rendering except that somebody took a bit of reality that they were at that moment rendering and locked it into into an object so if I take a photo that and I'm looking at somebody else's photo if I'm looking at somebody else's photo on the internet I am I am accessing a teeny clone of a little teeny bit of themselves that has been rendered distinct as a distinct object rather than as a rather than as part of the flow of experience because of course while we we always experience reality as a progression through a fluid series of events understood through this framework we call time we don't well, we experience it like that, but we don't understand it like that. We can't understand it like that. We have to lock it down into something that we can count on to remain unchanging. Come on. Come on in. If we want to be able to reference it and do anything about it, you know? <laughs> so, it it's something's either distinct in which case we can talk about it and we can do things with it and we can make changes even and then it becomes it create new distinctions etc or it's not distinct in which case it's not defined in which case it's not a thing so that issue of distinction is what causes time objects to be as objectively real as space objects and that the sense that somehow a space object is more real because it appears to persist in the absence of experiencing it that's an illusion that's created because each individual is rendering his or her own reality independently the the it gives the illusion that space objects don't have to be perceived in order to be existent but it is an illusion because it's impossible to conceive of a space object existing without observations just the same way as it is impossible to conceive of a time object existing without observation. The difference is it goes the other direction, but it's the same it's the same concept, right? We think, well, space objects must exist without perception because basically because there's there's a gap between it right like you don't have to have knowledge that that there's a a trap a, a covered over hole in the ground that I've set up with spikes underneath it right and I've covered it with leaves you don't have to have knowledge of that and I don't have to be actively observing it for you to fall into the trap and kill yourself and get killed. I mean, not kill yourself, me kill you, I guess. That's not the trap, right? But it, you don't have to have knowledge of it. I don't have to be actively observing it for it to impact you. But the reality is, had I not observed the making of the thing by doing it, then it wouldn't have been real. And that... just because 
it is still there when you come back later it doesn't make it any difference in a time object so obviously and somebody can in the same sense that somebody can click a web a click a link and get an unexpected uh, autoplay video or something so too can somebody do equivalent with a space object so now let's move to the moral imperative point so a moral imperative is just a statement that's all or a conditional or whatever you want to call it but it's it's a sentence or a series of sentences that indicate a description of the nature of reality such that the nature of reality is if one behaves in accordance with this imperative one behaves correctly and morally and if one violates this imperative one fails to do so it's it's not exactly prescriptive I mean well it's meaningfully prescriptive which is to say it doesn't require any predictions in order to know what to do so it it does indicate how a just person acts it indicates how a moral person acts it's a time object that establishes a means to to afford status to behaviors and other agents in by utilizing a standard system or a at least a it purports itself to be the one true ethical rule and it asserts that it would stand scrutiny as such within any and all of the fair approaches to adjudicating the validity of such a claim but it's not consensus that makes it true what makes it true is the same thing that makes pi true why is it that you can't say that using pi to find the circumference of a circle or whatever you find from that I don't remember diameter or whatever that that's that's true or false it's just kinda your opinion no it's not my opinion it's a fact how do we know well we can try it out try a bunch of circles and, and try different things other than pi let's try seven instead let's try 45 those don't work we get the wrong results what happens when we attempt to utilize a false moral law same exact fucking thing you end up with inconsistencies shit conflicts with itself it doesn't make sense in, in the space object world we have math to describe the grammar of space objects in the time object world we have moral, the moral imperative the one moral imperative is the, as the axiomatic math of morality and the assorted formulas and stuff you do with the math of morality emerges from the logically implied next steps of that so you start with your axioms and you move on from there and the reason why it's objectively undeniably true in the same way that that a squared plus b squared equals c squared will produce you the right answer but a squared plus b squared plus c cubed will not oh well obviously that must not be the case oh you can't divide by zero because if you do then it messes up the system that's there there's lots of ways in which we know that some maths are correct and some maths are not but the number one thing is 
You can't break the system. I can't have a, a proof of a math formulation that requires people to accept that anytime you divide something by zero, the answer is infinity without reconciling that claim with all the additional, with all the existent maths that say that, that would be destroyed if we were to affirm that claim. Thank you. So if we were to affirm the claim that dividing something by zero produces an outcome of infinity, an answer of infinity every time, then we would have to reconcile that with other maths that suggest the exact opposite. And and test it against that system of axioms that's required to be consistent, to be considered valid. Nobody questions it. Why? Because it's based on space objects. The same fucking rules apply to morality, except it's based on time objects. So that's why relativism is bullshit, okay? Cultural relativism, ethical relativism, aesthetic relativism are just as bullshit as spatial relativism. Can you imagine, what is this? Well, it, that depends, Eric. It depends on your opinion. If you, if you say it's a, a bucket of rocks, then that's what it is. And if you say it's a cup of coffee, then that's what it is. Is that okay? Can I be relativist about my objects? I didn't hit you with my car. I tickled you with a feather. What do you mean? You hit me with your car. No. That's not objective. Stop trying to... Stop trying to impose your ontology on me. I'm a bird. I can, I'm going to fly away now. Nobody would make that argument. That... We ought to that that yes, we ought to treat we ought to treat ethics and the physical world differently. We ought to assume that the nature the the, the distinction of an object is relative. That it's it's up to you to decide. It's your opinion. It's subjective. You know. That that this this could be a lighter. If I say it is, it could be anything. You know. It's an elephant. Can you tell? I Oh, you didn't know? My in my culture, this is used to put in zoos. We put these in zoos. And we and they carry people around on their backs. But they don't carry people around on their backs. And you could put it in a zoo, but that wouldn't make it an animal. Listen, stop being metaphysically colonialist, Eric. Your metaphysical imperialism is bothering me. You don't get to tell me what objects are. I get to decide what they are for me, and you can decide for you. Look, first I'll use this baseball bat to play baseball, and then you use this baseball bat to bake a cake. And so the reason it's obviously absurd with space objects is the utility is super concrete. But the utility is no less objectively certain and important and concrete, really, with moral stuff uh, it the only reason we tend to to be less certain about it is because if I go up to you and say this is a lady named Donna it's it's easy to say, it's easy to show why it's not. You say, okay, well, how do you define a lady? What are, what are some of the attributes of a lady? Give me one. 
Well, it's bigger than a than a cell bug. Okay, well, give me another. Give me something that is unique to this. It's also unique to a lady. It can't be unique to both, Eric. <laughs> you misunderstand the word unique. Okay, fine. I'm saying, how can I tell other ladies? Are they all? Do they all look like this? So at some point you 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 talk it out and you realize, okay, well, you're using the word lady to mean something different than I'm using the word lady to mean. Or you're insane. That's not a lady named Donna. This is not a lady named Donna. It's a couple copies of a McDonald's. Oh well, that's our that's our slang term for it. Lady named Donna is what we call a couple copy from McDonald's. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll start calling it that now too. If we say you, I didn't do anything wrong. I beat him to death because. I felt my life was threatened. It's the same thing. So when that cop beat Kelly Thomas to death, those cops did, and he's a homeless guy who was basically begging for mercy and calling for his father and please help me, I can't breathe. You know, just the normal shit. The cops are ignoring his his suffering and and choosing violence. It's absolutely unnecessary on the grounds that they feel they have enough excuse to get away with it. That's an example of something that we all know is immoral. The cops got let off by the jury. One of those cops then went to Denny's sometime after that and was spotted, recognized by somebody in the Denny's who was a good citizen and, and called it out and said, hey, it's that cop who beat that guy to death. And the whole restaurant condemned him, stood up and shamed him until he left. Someone might point to the jury verdict as evidence that Morality is too mushy to reach consensus on. My point is we already have consensus on it. And the only reason it's mushy is because of relativism. And the only reason relativism persists is because relativists have been winning an argument they should never have had any opportunity to win in the first place. They have the losing arguments. Their points don't withstand any scrutiny. They end up making no claims at all and not even being able to defend that. So, your choices are two in this world. You either ascribe to a metaphysics that's meaningful, that's sound, that's built upon a furious effort to dismantle everything that might possibly fall apart under a million tons of pressure and having engaged in that process for a long time now I tell you what doesn't fall apart there's only one thing Kant's deontological moral imperative and the negative rights framework that is another way of putting the same thing really I encourage you to win the argument against it rather than withholding judgment. Withholding judgment is making a judgment in favor of relativism. If you disagree with what I'm saying here, if you think that there's no moral absolutes, that we are not able to reach consensus on this because it's comprised of opinion or something like that, I ask you to engage my argument directly. 
I ask you to defend relativism against something specific. It should be easy to do. I'm asking you to be the neg, to say, disprove, negate my case. You don't have to win. 50-50 neg wins, right? You just have to render it mushy like everything else. But you can't. Because this isn't like everything else. This is the truth. It really is. I strongly encourage everyone to reflect on the importance of attaining a sound moral absolutism in manifesting the world we'd like to see real. A world of justice, liberty, empowerment of individuals, and the pursuit of not just happiness, the pursuit of actualization. With life, liberty, justice, and the pursuit of actualization for all. Thank you for watching Talk with Famous People. And good night, America and the world.